Welcome everyone to track 13 of uh, EPICS 2020. Uh, our topic of discussion for today is titled COVID-19 therapies. How do they affect us in the ICU? My name is Pippa Thiers, and I'm a respiratory and critical care medicine physician from the National University Hospital Singapore. And I will be your moderator for the session today. During the course of today's talk, we will be taking questions from our audience, which I will then post to the panelists during each segment. So this is meant to be an interactive session and you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to post questions, which I will then direct to our panelists. Today, we are pleased to be joined by five expert panelists from Singapore who will be sharing with us their thoughts about the myriad of COVID-19 therapies and the evolution of our approach to the novel coronavirus. The topics for our discussion today will include Kalitra, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, remdesivir, steroids, uh, matters regarding intubation and non-invasive uh, ventilation and HFNC, as well as regarding uh, some tips on practical implementation of COVID-19 therapies in our ICU. So our panelists for today, in order of appearance, are Dr. Ling Li Min, Dr. Louis Chai, Dr. Siwa Duan, Dr. Pua Se Hon, and Dr. Tan Chi Kiet. Our first panelist for today is Dr. Ling Li Min, who is an infectious diseases physician at the National Center for Infectious Disease and Tan Tock Seng Hospital, Singapore. Dr. Ling is the founding lead of the TTSH Intensive Care Unit, Multidisciplinary ID and Hematology ID Services. Since January 2020, she has been actively involved with the care of COVID-19 patients in both the ICU and general wards. She's also a co-investigator for the Adaptive COVID-19 Treatment Trials, Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3, and is also the lead for the COVID-19 Immunomodulatory Clinical Workgroup at TTSH. So Dr. Ling, uh, our first point of discussion revolves around the antiviral treatment of Kalitra, uh, lopinavir ritonavir combination, which had previously been employed for the treatment of SARS and MERS. Could you share with us your initial thoughts and experience regarding the use of ritonavir, lopinavir in COVID-19? And what your thoughts are now with all the new data that has since emerged? Dr. Ling, please. Yeah. Thank you, Pip. Thanks for the kind introduction. If you don't mind, I'd like to share two slides just to set the scene for answering your question. Uh, yes, please. Okay. okay, are you able to see this? Yes, we can, okay. thank you. All right. So um, I have to say that whatever I'm going to discuss today is based on our experience and what we have been prescribing at National Center for Infectious Diseases, NCID. And um, essentially, um, for the first half of this year, prior to all the clinical trial data, uh, we were using um, Kalitra, hydroxychloroquine, interferon, tocilizumab on an off-label basis, depending on the severity of illness for COVID patients. And I'm just going to present very quickly a quick summary as to what were some of the key publications or certain observations that had, that had been um, brought up based on the publications, which allowed us to sort of tweak our um, clinical decisions subsequently when it came to starting or stopping these um, uh, therapies. So Kalitra um, was actually one of the first few drugs that we considered simply because that there was um, already an existence in vitro as well as some in vivo data for its use in MERS and SARS. And then there was that uh, February publication from Wuhan. They had 200 patients, 15% um, of them used Galitra. Overall mortality was um, 20%. And around that point in time, some of us were feeling like, you know, anecdotally on the ground, while we were prescribing Galitra, we just kind of felt that it didn't really seem to have much impact. You know, it almost seemed like patients that were going to do well would have done well anyway, versus those who weren't going to do well. And then the publication from Tao, um, Tao Bin confirmed that in May because um, that was a study which looked at Kalitra versus placebo and the, there was no significant impact on 28-day mortality. At the same time, the primary endpoint outcome was timed to a clinical improvement as measured by the ordinal scale. There was no impact on that. As for the 28-day mortality, Kalitra had no impact on that. It's again echoed at, in the recovery trial published in October, and then the, as well as the solidarity trial, which some of which I think um, 
the other speakers will allude to later. And this is a preprint that was uh, uh, made available sometime last week. Okay. Next, azithromycin. Now, we do not prescribe this. Um, we certainly felt like there wasn't, from the very beginning, we felt that there really wasn't enough data to support its use of label. However, I have to say that, um, you know, there was a French study over here sometime in March, and that did tweak our interest a little bit, but not enough for us to actually think about it seriously. Okay. Then I'd like to bring you to two trials, RCTs, which looked at the impact of azithromycin with or without hydroxychloroquine um, and it's versus um, placebo. So it's coalition one and two. Coalition one looked at patients that had mild to moderate um, COVID pneumonia. Coalition two uh, for those patients with severe COVID pneumonia. And what they found in the primary endpoint was that whether or not azithromycin was added had no impact at all on 28 on the um, time to recovery based on the ordinal scale measurements. At the same time, also no impact at all on 28-day mortality across all groups. So placebo or standard of care versus azithromycin with or without hydroxychloroquine, okay? Um, I'm just gonna bring up these two retrospective studies simply because they are fairly large studies, a thousand plus patients each. The French study by Million had about a thousand patients who received azithromycin and, and hydroxychloroquine. Again, um, they, I guess what's impressive is that for this particular group, they, re their reported death rate was only at 0.75%. Um, the other thing to note is also that the rates of obesity in the French population, in that particular French study, was less than 10%. Now, in contrast, the Rosenberg study that was from New York, the rates of obesity there was more than 40%. The age range of patients were quite similar to the French study. And the overall mortality across all groups, so whether or not they had azithromycin, was quite similar and was around 20%. Okay. Next, hydroxychloroquine. Well, um, okay, we've already mentioned recovery trial. We've also talked about the coalition one trial. Again, negative results for hydroxychloroquine versus um, standard of care. The other thing I wanted to bring up was that in the earlier days, I think people were also interested to explore its use in the management of um, improving clinical symptoms in mild COVID patients who was managed as an outpatient. Now, this particular study by Skipper found that hydroxychloroquine also did not have significant impact in terms of clinical improvement in cough and fever over a 14-day period. Okay. So I'd like to allude you to this particular study here by Ashad. Firstly, it's a large study, retrospective cohort, 2,000 patients on hydroxychloroquine with or without, um, I mean, in addition to standard of care. And he, they found, and what's impressive is that um, they had, the hydroxychloroquine group had much better survival curves compared to those patients who did not have hydroxychloroquine. However, a point to note was that the major confounder for this study was that up to 70% of their patients were on steroids. And now on to the interferon. So again, interferon, we thought about its use very early on, sometime February, March this year, simply because again, based on the in vitro data that was available for its use in SARS and MERS. Okay. Um, and then there was the Hong Kong study published in, in May, whereby interferon 1B was added onto a backbone of Calitra and Ribavirin, And they found that the interferon group had a significant a more rapid clearance of viral carriage of COVID in the nasal pharynx at seven days compared to the people who did not receive interferon and they cleared their virus over a medium period of 11 days. Okay. The Baldi study, um, which added interferon 1A to a backbone of antiretrovirals as well as hydroxychloroquine, um, found that those people who had interferon 1A had a significant reduction in risk for death as well as for intubation. And currently ACTT3 trial is still undergoing for recruitment of patients into two arms. Remdesivir is a backbone. Uh, treatment arm is interferon 1A versus placebo. So finally on to tocilizumab. Well, I have to say that um, overall, I think our experience with tocilizumab has been, I wouldn't say entirely positive or negative, but uh, um, but we really didn't have 
we really did not prescribe a lot of tazilizumab at all to begin with. Um, so retrospective studies, cohort studies, describe their experience when tazilizumab was added on to standard of care. These two studies had about 200, 100 plus 200 patients on tazilizumab. The Italian study found that um, patients who were on tazilizumab certainly had better outcomes in terms of rates of intubation and 28-day mortality compared to those who didn't. The, the, um, the American study found that the patients who were on tazilizumab, um, whether or not they had severe or non-severe COVID infections, their survivals were similar. However, this wasn't entirely reflected in the clinical trial. So the Covector trial, which has since been seized, um, did not reach primary endpoint. And primary endpoint for them was over a 28-day period, time to clinical recovery as measured by ordinal scale. Um, it was a negative result for that. At the same time, there was no impact on 28-day mortality, time to intubation, as well as time to discharge. Okay. And PECTOR study um, had similar uh, methodology, but this was done in a population that of um, minority groups as well as the underprivileged. So they had, I put a tick there because they had a positive outcome of a 44% risk reduction in rates of intubation as well as um, deaths. But in terms of time to discharge, in terms of um, that, it was not significant. Okay. So currently for tozilizumab, I think, you know, there's still, there's still ongoing trials to determine or confirm its impact or lack of impact on the recovery of COVID patients with recovery as well as remdacta. So I'm going to stop here and I'm just going to summarize by saying that based on our own experience um, over the past 10 months, certainly we were using, well, we prescribed um, Calitra to about 30 plus patients interferon and Calitra to about 20 additional more patients. Um, we prescribed hydroxychloroquine to about 30 patients and interferon and sorry, tocilizumab to about four patients at our center. Um, this was at the point in time whereby we hadn't had the publications, the positive publications on, on, on dexamethasone as well as from Desivir yet. Um, but based on what we now already know, I have to say the quick answer is we will no longer be using these drugs on an off-label basis. Um, certainly the, the key backbone for us will be remdesivir and steroids. Um, and we await the clinical trials to advise us on whether or not we should be adding any of these other agents in addition to remdesivir and steroids. Um, I'm just gonna stop there. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Ling. Uh, so for those of you who have uh, just joined us, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens uh, to post any questions uh, for our speakers. And uh, as Dr. Ling has alluded to, we have uh, really quite moved away from the use of uh, Calitra and uh, uh, tocilizumab or interferon and into the realms of using things like remdesivir uh, and steroids instead. And having uh, to share with us now is uh, Dr. Lewis. Uh, Dr. Lewis, I understand you're part of the uh, research effort along with our Dr. Ling uh, into the use of remdesivir during the early phases of the pandemic. Can you uh, share with us what you know, your experience was like with remdesivir and what your thoughts are about the drug now? Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, may I be permitted to do a share screen? So, so I'm going to take this as a uh, uh, prelude to uh, the discussion on my topic on uh, remdesivir and thank you very much once again for uh, the invite to, uh, to this uh, session. And um, I agreed to take up this topic on remdesivir, of course, uh, not knowing that uh, it has uh, gone on to stir up a small controversy uh, in the past week regarding its utility in uh, COVID-19. So do permit me first to share with you, uh, you know, uh, as per the topic of this uh, panel's uh, discussion on how the therapies actually do affect us uh, in the ICUs whereby uh, we practice. So I'm just going to share with you uh, a small splatter of uh, five cases of whereby of patients whom we have encountered. And the first one is a 62-year-old lady. This is one of our first patients who actually came into the hospital, she came in from the Safra cluster, and uh, presented with uh, shortness of breath, fever, and uh, being 62, elderly, rapidly deteriorated. 
And um, as those of you who um, we have worked closely together with, you'll be familiar that uh, we use uh, three uh, basic markers to monitor uh, the progress and uh, clinical cost of the patients. We use ferritin, LDH, and CRP. And of course, these were the days whereby uh, we uh, were still feeling around you know, the utility of uh, scope of drugs that's available for COVID-19. And uh, you can see that uh, right early on in the early days, uh, we didn't have much to offer. And this is what you would see as the natural cause of uh, illness of the patient uh, without therapeutics, whereby in, uh, hopefully the majority of the patients, even those who actually drop down to ICU, there is a, 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 a progressive recovery over time. And even in the very critically ill, as in this other patient who was actually put on ECMO, and through the course of time, without definitive therapeutics, you can see how the markers, be it ferritin as a surrogate marker of inflammation, LDH as a surrogate marker of lung function, and CRP likewise, which functions uh, and mirrors uh, ferritin trends, actually can progressively uh, improve over time. Then, you know, come the clinical trials for remdesivir. And this is actually a 39-year-old uh, foral domestic uh, dog worker who uh, had no other comorbidities, but had definite pneumonia, with patches on the chest x-ray and fever, and was actually on oxygen. He was put on the Rendesivir trial, and you can see how he had been initially been persistently febrile through the initial days of uh, admission, and after which uh, he was started on Rendesivir at about the third day of admission, and how seemingly the fever actually receded after treatment. Here, it's another patient and, uh, who is 50 years old, who's actually a pretty, very well female, very active Singaporean, who actually caught COVID-19 from her son returning from UK. She actually was extremely well in the ward for five days and uh, with uh, the development of a patch fever. And she took a while before she agreed and consented to uh, being uh, enrolled onto the Rendesivir trial. And we gave her the drug. And unfortunately, the day after, she deteriorated uh, and had to be intubated. And this patient, as you can follow, the clinical cause actually was extremely and unexpectedly eventful uh, through the course of her stay in ICU, despite the fact that she was young and uh, with no past medical history. But of course, uh, we managed to get her through and uh, she's currently well. To share with you the last case, this is one of our uh, other uh, patients who uh, did not make it. 67 years old, Chinese male with hypertension. Uh, COVID-19, again, uh, was started, first was given a trial of Calitra in the ward. And then when we thought that he wasn't doing well, when he became oxygen dependent, he was actually offered a uh, 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 remdesivir on a trial basis, and uh, was actually uh, 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 given a day before he deteriorated, intubated, uh, had extended ICU stay and of course, unfortunately, as you can follow his LDH trend, uh, he, there was an adverse outcome. So what you can see from uh, the, the few splatter of cases I've presented to date is that seemingly, um, you know, number one is the majority of the patients, even in the absence of the definitive uh, antiviral therapies, seemingly do get the better of the infection. Of course, there seems to be some suggestion of utility. And of course, now there's this debatable utility on uh, the role made by uh, Randasavir. And of course, you can see too that despite the initiation of what seemingly is thought to be the uh, appropriate therapy, there are some cohorts of patients who actually do not seem to benefit tremendously from the drug and to the extent of which there may be even an adverse outcome. So let me just uh, switch on. I'm going to stop share here and I'm going to now share with you another table. To on. Okay. Uh, I hope all of you are able to see uh, this Excel table which I'm going to share with you and which is what, uh, like Dr. Ling, I've actually put together the relevant uh, clinical trials on remdesivir to date. And if I can just orientate you to the table, um, I'm trying to summarize uh, not the 
the clinical trials for which the lightly colored ones as compared in contrast to the darkly, more dark gray colored ones are the ones which were deemed to be so-called the, not so, the unfavorable, not unsuccessful trials. The dark gray tables are the ones whereby were the deemed as success. And um, I will put here corners the design, the design of the trial, as well as some of the uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, the main, uh, of course, uh, the, the major primary endpoints which most of the trials look at were either clinical improvement, which is actually deemed as having a two point ordinal score improvement uh, from baseline at admission, at recruitment. And of course, what most of us are ultimately interested in, which is actually uh, mortality at 28 days. Of course, there are also secondary endpoints that are uh, well of interest in some of the studies as reflected by the days the patient is uh, intubated, uh, oxygenation support, and uh, hospitalization. So I'm just going to run through with you uh, the trials that uh, we know of date. Number one that came out was, of course, the one which uh, raised eyebrows of Gilead. This is the Chinese study uh, that came out in Lancet, which compared right in the early days of the outbreak in uh, China, the role of Randesavir, which was given then on a trial and compassionate basis versus standard of care. And it was actually done in the R uh, RCT setting, double blind, with a two to one ITT ratio. And of course, uh, this was the trial that actually uh, showed that there was not a significant difference in patients who did or received or did not receive Rendesivir in terms of the time of improvement, okay, the mortality, and likewise uh, the ventilation days, as it seems actually from the overall picture. Of course, this actually raised uh, quite con concern with, uh, from Gilead. Of course, one of the criticisms of the study was that uh, the study numbers were actually possibly inadequate to reflect uh, uh, adequate power for significance. And of course, the gold standard of the study came about uh, by the Act 1 study by John Bagel, which came out in England in May, in which uh, the point call was actually a comparison between the standard of care and a 10 days treatment regimen of Brandesivir. And this, of course, in the eyes of uh, the very puristic trialist, one that consists of a randomized double blind RCT that was multi center, including uh, not just US but outside US, and in a one to one ratio consisting of almost a thousand patients. And of course, the primary endpoint that was uh, set for this study was that of clinical time to clinical improvement, uh, again, as stipulated by a two point ordinal score improvement, whereby they were able to achieve. A statistical significance through uh, with a hazards ratio of improvement of faster time to improvement of between from 15 days in the placebo group to uh, uh, improvement of in shorter by four days in patients who receive remdesivir with a hazards ratio of 1.32. All right, and if of course this study of course was an improvement over the Chinese study where they were then able to sub stratify patients in accordance the point of entry of the clinical trials for which uh, they were broken up into ordinal score two, three, four, five, six, seven. But for simplicity, I've actually simplified that to patients who are on oxygen versus patients who are actually on mechanical ventilation. And you can see that uh, the, 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 the utility of the drug is most evident in patients who are not ventilated, but patients who are actually on oxygen therapy with a hazards ratio of 1.47. Similarly, they look at mortality, though this was not the primary endpoint. And overall, this failed to achieve uh, clinical significance. Uh, despite, though, if you look at the fine prints, which is sometimes overlooked by others, that Randesivir actually did have a lower uh, percentage of mortality of 14, 11% as compared to 15% for those who are on placebo. And then again, if you break down, you know, uh, read between the lines to extract the individual numbers from this study, what you can see here is that actually, if again, you break up into patients who are ventilated versus those who are just on oxygen therapy, that there is actually a reduction, if a reduction in a hazards ratio of 0 0.3 in those who are actually just on oxygen and unventilated. 
And what you can see here is that the hazards ratio is uh, clearly below one. Of course, unfortunately, in those who uh, ventilate, you can see that the hazards ratio crosses one, and there is actually not a clear reduction in mortality in this group. But overall, this was actually deemed, unfortunately, a slight disappointment in that overall, in all the cohort of patients, the drug was unable to bring down mortality to a significant level. Looking across the rest of the parameters in terms of uh, the ventilation days, Rendesivir reduced uh, ventilation by three days, uh, reduced the need for oxygen support by eight days, and likewise, uh, a reduction in the hospitalization. So this was actually deemed a, a successful clinical study. And the next study that I'm going to skip the study by uh, Goldman and actually go on because that was actually not an RCT, but I'm just going to go on to uh, the, the JAMA paper by uh, Chris Spinner, which is basically the moderate protocol of uh, the GLAD trial. And this actually, I have to emphasize here, involves patients who had moderate COVID, which were defined as patients who were not oxygen requiring more than 94% upon the recruitment of the trial, but did have pneumonia. And this was again a trial whereby it was designed uh, ideally with a placebo standard of care versus Rendesivir of five days versus Rendesivir of 10 days and uh, involving approximately 600 patients. So the primary endpoint that again they were looking at is actually time to improvement. And the initial trial uh, uh, that was reported actually looked at a cutoff, a preliminary cutoff of status at day 11. And uh, this is where uh, the preliminary report was issued. And uh, assessment of status at day 11 of treatment or post-treatment uh, showed that there was actually a higher odds of uh, improved uh, status by the ordinal scale. And I'm going to highlight here the odds ratio of 1.65 only for patients uh, with uh, five days of redesivir treatment. And uh, more data that came out that just were released uh, at IDISA recently, whereby now when uh, the clinical status was further assessed at 28, the hazards ratio actually was uh, 1.15, uh, with uh, again a slight tendency for improved uh, status in favor of brandesivir. Okay, you have to be mindful too that these patients uh, were so-called better in status as compared to those on the John Bagel study at one. So the mortality rate uh, you would expect will be less for all the patients here and at a rate of uh, 2% for patients on standard of care versus patients on uh, mortality of 1%. And here, of course, I have to say that the hazards ratio certainly crossed uh, one. And uh, oxygen support seemingly, uh, again, is not exactly significant. I'm just going to run down, of course, the next in comparison to the solidarity study, which uh, came out of in the past uh, week plus and stirred up uh, some uh, controversy. I think um, the, 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 came, the trial came at a time whereby, unfortunately, too, that uh, uh, Act 2, the paper, was actually being due to be submitted to a major journal. So the authors of Act 2 were up in arms, uh, you know, saying that this publication possibly compromised the, uh, the, the strength of the Act 2 findings. But in short, uh, you, we, we have to say that this is actually done in uh, a totally separate setting where it was open label, multiple uh, randomized, uh, multi-center, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, but of course, uh, 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 the patients were, of course, not, this was not done in the totally ideal, puristic trial setting where you have got you no know, good QCs, but of course it was done in the middle of a battle of a war. And they could grab basically what you know they could, uh, what 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 was available, and uh, and these were patients where you know they were not ideally selected in inverted commas, of which uh, two thirds were on oxygen and a third were actually uh, not on oxygen, and uh, what you can see here is that they were very simple. The endpoint was just mortality, and the mortality, as you can see here, was that it it basically crossed had a, a one and that it showed that there was actually uh, no reduction in the mortality. But however, again, if you read between the lines and go down to the fine prints of the study, you can see that actually there was actually a preference towards, again, patients who were not ventilated, 
But by the hazards ratio, actually did go down, but unfortunately they did also cross one, but more to the left. And where again, patients on uh, mechanical ventilation did not do as well. And, and I think it's going to be uh, something that I'm going to go just quickly into, but just as comparative, because there's going to be a speaker talking about steroids. And if again, if you compare this with uh, the discovery uh, trial by Peter Hobby, and it is again showing a similar trend whereby uh, patients who were uh, uh, mechanically ventilated had less benefit. Uh, 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 I would say put it the other way around, whereby you know the uh, the requirement for treatment is actually a cohort selective, be it for remdesivir or for steroids. So in summary, I I personally do not see much uh, you know alarm in that uh, there seems to be apparently conflicting, but they are actually not conflicting, but they are actually data which is the matter of interpretation whether you can see the cut as half fill or half half full or half empty. I think to this day, I think the ID community and uh, uh, clinicians and physicians alike um, no, do not dispute the fact that uh, while Vendasevir has some utility, it is not an overwhelmingly strong uh, agent uh, uh, against uh, 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 COVID-19. And whereby, uh, of course, we are all, which is why we are all still in the perpetual search for uh, an effective therapy if we can ever achieve uh, that goal. Okay, it's just a matter of whether that limited utility against this disease actually happens to tilt more across to the right of the hazards ratio one line or a bit to the left. And this is actually being affected by the setting and the type of patient that uh, uh, the trial actually uh, entails. And, uh, I, and I think that actually fully explains you know, the, 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 what I still think is actually the slight variation of the results, just whether or not it tips more to the right of one, to the left of one, rather than the fact that whether or not it is effective. But more so, more importantly, is more in the type of patients that you apply the therapeutics on for which the dates uh, to date, most of the trials, almost all the trials suggest that it has to be hopefully applied early before the patients, way before the patients are intubated and on oxygen, unfortunately, because by virtue of the fact that trials, drug supply is limited, we probably would have to be very exact in trying to select the type of patients who are on treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chai, for that uh, comprehensive review of the uh, relevant remdesivir trials. Uh, apologies, I, I omitted to introduce Dr. Chai earlier. Uh, Dr. Chai is, of course, our senior consultant, infectious diseases physician, and an associate professor of our National University Health System in Singapore, and is also uh, the principal investigator of the Opportunistic Infections Group, uh, Divisions of Infectious Diseases at NUHS. And uh, Dr. Chai's interests lie in opportunistic and atypical infections in uh, immunocompromised host uh, and host pathogen interaction, which are also the themes of his research group. Uh, he's deeply entrenched at the bedside in providing clinical services for infectious diseases and internal medicine and in the ICU as well. Uh, Dr. Chai is funded by the National Medical Research Council of Singapore and the National University Health System. Uh, Dr. Chai, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to uh, just quickly ask you another uh, question about your thoughts on remdesivir, specifically its uh, application uh, in the ICU setting then. Uh, since we now know that uh, the use of remdesivir uh, primarily is in patients uh, that are on oxygen early on in their course of disease uh, and mainly to shorten uh, the duration of illness and improve their time to recovery. Uh, would it be too bold of me to say that it doesn't really quite have a role uh, in our ICU patients anymore? I think uh, at this point in time, I would have to say that the use of remdesivir and, um, and uh, steroids actually just highlights the biphasic, or at least the minimally biphasic cause of illness of COVID-19, which uh, of course many today have tried to schematize and uh, to, in, in a, in a uh, whereby patients probably in the first day one to day seven to day 10 of illness actually are more by me, and after which that in some page selected or susceptible patient cohort that is actually an immune phase. So, of course, then um, we will have to be quite, uh, we'll, we'll, at least we we'll want to be attempt to delineate at which phase of illness the patients are, because of course patients may actually enter ICU uh, 
of course, the majority of patients may actually enter ICU when actually they go into a big time uh, immune flare. So I think being able to, or, or trying to delineate every phase of illness of the patient will of course uh, uh, give us greater confidence whether or not uh, the use of uh, remdesivir uh, would be appropriate in that setting versus uh, uh, steroids. And of course, I think the jury is still out there because uh, there is actually the absence of data. Whether the combination of both remdesivir and dexamethasone would actually be uh, an appropriate uh, therapeutic option for patients in the ICU. So I would say that the jury is still out there on uh, its, its utility as to how much we will allow remdesivir to spill over in patients uh, who are already in ICU versus, of course, uh, combination therapeutics with remdesivir, which is why uh, current clinical trials are actually still attempting to answer. Thank you, Dr. Chai. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ling, uh, also as a co-investigator for the remdesivir trial, do you have anything else uh, you'd like to add about your thoughts uh, regarding the use of remdesivir now? Oops. Um, I think I agree with Louis. Certainly, um, I think a lot of the patients uh, who end up in ICU, most of the time, they are already hypoxic in the general ward, and it is also possible that remdesivir would already have been started in the general ward, and when they go into ICU, um, it's just a continuation to complete the remdesivir. As a clinician, um, if you ask me whether, I mean, there is, I would say that insufficient data to support the use blanket statement for me to say, no, I will not offer remdesivir to ICU patients, especially if they were directly admitted from emergency department to ICU and is already hypoxic, has got ARDS. I don't think I'm at the comfort zone whereby I'm clinically ready to say that I won't offer remdesivir to such types of patients until I see um, perhaps more convincing data to suggest otherwise. But based on what we have, I would still say that yes, um, I would still use remdesivir even if the patient was admitted directly from ICU and is already extremely hypoxic and has to be intubated and with evidence and it's beyond the first seven days of illness, there's already evidence of ARDS and who knows, may even need to go on ECMO. I would still offer remdesivir. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, Dr. Ling. Uh, for the rest of our participants, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A tab uh, to post questions uh, for our panellists. Uh, next up, uh, moving then uh, on to the ICU, uh, we have uh, Dr. Siwa. Uh, Dr. Siwa Duwan is a consultant respiratory physician and intensivist uh, working in the respiratory and critical care medicine department in Singapore General Hospital. Uh, he's currently the director of the medical intensive care unit there and heads the respiratory ECMO support there as well. Uh, his areas of include, interest include uh, advanced respiratory support for ARDS, tracheostomy care, rapid response system, pulmonary hypertension, and lung transplantation. In addition to his clinical services, Dr. Siwa is passionate in medical education and has received numerous awards for his uh, contributions. He is also uh, the clinical coordinator for critical med care medicine in Duke and US and program director for the fundamentals of critical care support course in Singapore. During this COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Siwa has been leading the Singapore General Hospital's ICU preparedness team and has published his experience in the management of COVID-19 patients in several articles. Uh, Dr. Siwa, uh, on the first day of our uh, epics, we had the privilege of having uh, experts such as uh, Professor Gattinoni, who shared their opinions around the subject of uh, invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, high-flow nasal cannula, non-invasive ventilation, and measures such as a weight prone positioning uh, uh, in our ICU. Uh, could you uh, perhaps uh, share with us uh, your thoughts uh, about this as well? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Siwa. Uh, the question was meant for Dr. Poa, my apologies. Uh, Dr. Siwa, my, my question was uh, more uh, revolving around steroids, apologies, uh, as well as the recovery trials uh, and the use of steroids uh, in the ICU. Uh, Dr. Siwa, could you share with us about that, please? Uh, thanks, uh, Pip, uh, for the uh, kind introduction, uh, as well as the organizers uh, for this uh, meeting, for the kind invitation to, to share some of my thoughts on critical steroids uh, in the management of COVID-19. I think during this uh, pandemic, uh, we have seen a surge of uh, research relating to um, therapies uh, for COVID-19. 
And many of them are actually the very centered on very sexy the drugs like the remdesivir, the doxorubicin, and some of the old conventional treatment that we've been using the, for decades or even the, the centuries have largely the, been the, in the, the shadow. And I think uh, the how the therapy for COVID nineteen has uh, evolved uh, over the months has been pretty astonishing. And this is all thanks uh, to the words of uh, to the effort of many many the researchers uh, around the world who have uh, thought through the very carefully in terms of uh, how the, the understanding of COVID-19 has been and trying to actually identify the specific uh, areas where therapies can potentially uh, um, change the clinical cost uh, for the patient. And I think we have uh, heard very, uh, a lot about the recovery the trial as well as uh, some of the other the steroids and related uh, therapies uh, for COVID-19 that was uh, recently published in the September as well as uh, the meta-analysis that uh, was held by the WHO that accompanied the, uh, the JAMA edition around the same time. So I pretty much uh, would uh, basically uh, summarize uh, some of the uh, literature. And I think uh, this is something that uh, is, has been rapidly uh, evolving. And uh, whatever that we talk about uh, today would only be relevant uh, today. I mean, uh, I think uh, the literature uh, is coming up uh, so rapidly that I think uh, this area needs a uh, constant uh, review. So I just uh, basically uh, I will share my slides. Um, I think it's easier to, uh, to go through this uh, with the slides. I so just uh, I want to check that uh, did, uh, all of you are able to uh, see the slides. I guess we can see your slides. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think um, there are many, many the postulations on how COVID-19 the, the damage a patient once it gets uh, infected. And a lot of it is centered around how it actually stimulates the immunopathogenesis. And I think our understanding of how COVID-19 triggered the inflammatory response system is still relatively early. But I think what is, uh, that we can summarize is that from the perspective of COVID-19, um, what it does is that the initial site of entry is probably related to the pulmonary alveolar uh, and uh, the, uh, the epidemia, tillium. and uh, when the COVID-19 uh, invades a, the body cells, it causes or uh, stimulates a uh, cascade of inflammatory the response that may involve uh, various uh, cytokines and mediators such as uh, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, uh, tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha, and then the, that uh, created the environment uh, where the pulmonary the epithelium starts uh, to denudate and uh, have a capillary leakage, leading to the phenomenon of a pulmonary edema. And as the disease uh, progresses, we have a systemic uh, response leading to the phenomenon of uh, ARDS uh, with multi organ uh, dysfunction. And that is actually the pretty the much uh, uh, what pathologists uh, will see when they actually examine the POPSI specimen in patients who pass away uh, from COVID-19. I think the role of uh, critical steroids in the COVID-19 from a conceptual framework is, uh, can be uh, summarized in this uh, schematic. I have to say that uh, there's very much uh, we don't really understand where critical the steroids uh, may come into factor in the patients with inflammatory response. It's a very, very uh, blunt uh, instrument tool, but I think that because it's blunt and it works on the multiple uh, pathway, that conceptually may be a little bit uh, better in terms of the efficacy, um, instead of uh, specifically the targeting the uh, specific uh, signaling the pathway in the uh, dysregulated inflammation uh, response. And that may be a reason why the uh, uh, steroids have studies that have uh, positive uh, outcome as compared uh, to some of the other the studies uh, looking at the very, very specific immunomodulators such as the anti-leukin-6 or anti-leukin-1 inhibitor where they feel the, to show mortality the benefit. Um, as intensivists, uh, I think uh, corticosteroids uh, story has uh, been an internal uh, source of a controversy, uh, be it uh, in the management of patients with uh, pneumonia, in the patients of management in ARDS, and in the uh, management of patients uh, with uh, sepsis or septic uh, shock. And I think the evolution of uh, corticosteroids uh, has uh, been ongoing uh, for many uh, centuries. And uh, what we uh, no, nowadays I may be overturned by studies uh, that will surface uh, uh, many years uh, later. But I think uh, this is what um, uh, Dr. Chai was uh, trying to allude to when he was talking about the COVID-19 having a different uh, phases uh, where the viromic phase may occur in the early phase of the patient's uh, infection. 
and then transitioning uh, to a the post or inflammatory response for those uh, who do not uh, improve um, some of it uh, the following the infection. And I think the cortical steroids uh, probably work uh, in the phase uh, where they are starting uh, to mount uh, the host inflammatory response. And hopefully by targeting the immune response uh, in the appropriate uh, time frame, we are able to change the clinical course uh, for the patient and uh, hopefully to improve uh, mortality. When we look at uh, cortical steroids uh, in terms of management of uh, pneumonia, for example, I think there are many the studies uh, over the last uh, decade that seems to, to show uh, some promise in terms of uh, reducing time to, to treatment of failure, uh, as well as uh, reducing the uh, time to, to reach a clinical stability. But I think when it comes to efficacy in uh, improving patients' and mortality, this is something that is still relatively the, uh, controversial and uh, the studies are pretty the, inconsistent in terms of the mortality the benefit. And which was why the, in uh, various uh, society the guidelines uh, for community acquired pneumonia, uh, cortical steroids have not really the, been strongly the recommended, but may be recommended or may be considered in patients uh, with other indications uh, for, uh, for uh, using cortical steroids, for example, in patients uh, with uh, septic shock. And that is more the important when you think about uh, other forms of pneumonia, uh, not including bacterial pneumonia. All right, this is just a uh, summary of some of the uh, if, um, literature regarding the cortical steroid administration uh, for viral pneumonia. And in this particular diagram on the uh, left, we have the uh, mortality odds ratio for influenza to pneumonia. And you can see that uh, in patients uh, with um, uh, influenza to pneumonia, cortical steroid to use may be associated uh, with increased uh, mortality as well as increased risk of nosocomial uh, infection. So this is not something that is uh, entirely uh, benign for the, all forms of uh, pneumonia. And uh, from the experience uh, from SARS and MERS, we also have uh, um, studies that actually showed that uh, the use of cortical steroids may potentially to reduce the uh, clearance of the uh, viruses uh, from uh, from the patient, and that can actually prolong the viremic uh, phase uh, for the patient. That is why the, in the very initial phase during the pandemic, the WHO has made the uh, initial recommendations that uh, cortical steroids uh, should not be routinely used outside the context of a clinical uh, trial because of all this uh, concern. I think everyone is aware the, that uh, this uh, recommendation is, uh, has changed because of uh, various uh, landmark uh, studies. And uh, we'll both go through the recovery trial because I think this is the, by far the largest uh, um, uh, randomized uh, trial that actually to support the, the use of critical uh, steroids, in particular the dexamethasone in hospitalized uh, patients with COVID. And this was uh, published uh, not so long ago to, uh, in the late July and September, uh, late July uh, period. So I think uh, this is a study that uh, was done uh, in the uh, NHI the healthcare system in the UK. And uh, this is a very ambitious uh, trial and it adopts a um, uh, trial to format that we call the adaptive uh, platform. And what the researchers are trying to uh, do is that uh, in this uh, era of uh, pandemic where a large amount of patients may be coming in and then maybe new information uh, coming in regards to different uh, therapy, they want a very flexible uh, trial to design. And uh, because this is a very pretty the pragmatic uh, study, so the inclusion of criteria are pretty the broad. Uh, so they recruited uh, patients initially the, for just adults, but subsequently they modified it to also include the pediatric uh, patients. And uh, any patients that uh, with uh, COVID-19 was admitted uh, to the uh, hospital uh, would be eligible for the recruitment into the trial. And there are various uh, interventions that actually have been tested. And, um, and one arm of it uh, would include the standard uh, 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 no the additional the therapy, which will add as the uh, so-called placebo, but uh, not really placebo, it's just a uh, so-called standard of care at that time. Uh, at the time of publication of recovery, the trial, I think the loperamide, uh, retor um, the calitra as well as the hydrochloroquine has, arms has already been stopped because of uh, lack of efficacy. And uh, in this uh, particular trial where they were testing the use of uh, dexamethasone at a dose of uh, six milligrams uh, once a day uh, for up to uh, 10 days. Um, and uh, they included the patients uh, who are not on oxygen therapy, who required oxygen therapy but are not mechanical ventilated, and also the mechanically ventilated the patients or patients on ECMO. And the primary outcome that we're looking at was uh, 28 days of all cause uh, death, and there is a variety of uh, secondary outcomes that they were also uh, looking at. 
So uh, if just look at the baseline, the demographics, uh, so the, this is uh, very typical of uh, uh, what a patient uh, would look like uh, in the, uh, who are relatively unwell and hospitalized uh, to the patient, uh, to the hospital uh, with a COVID infection. So these are relatively the older group of uh, patients and uh, predominant, and there's a predominance of uh, male uh, patients. And the medium the days, the number of days since the symptoms are onset was about uh, eight days. So if you go back uh, to, if you, if you believe the concept of a viromic phase and also the concept about uh, uh, the host inflammatory response developing after the one week of uh, symptoms uh, onset, this may be looking at the patients who are starting to develop a host uh, inflammatory uh, response. And if you look at the obstetrician, the respiratory, the support that the participants uh, receive, there's a myriad of uh, different severity and the majority of the patients are only requiring the oxygen um, and so there's a small group of patients that require invasive mechanical ventilation and another group that have no uh, oxygen uh, requirement. Um, and the comorbidities are very, not very different from the, uh, the uh, co comorbidities that we expect uh, for any patients that's hospitalized uh, for COVID-19 uh, infection. So I think uh, this is a summary of the uh, recovery the results. If you look at just the overall uh, group, the odds, uh, the um, the mortality the rate ratio is actually the lower the, for all comers of uh, and the rate is actually the 0.83 with a confidence interval of 0.75 uh, to 0.93 and this is clinically the significance and in favor of uh, the use of uh, dexamethasone and if you look at the uh, breakdown on in the which uh, subgroup of patients may potentially to have the biggest uh, mortality the benefit it is actually the, the patients uh, who are on the invasive mechanical the ventilation, as well as the patients uh, who are on oxygen the therapy. And uh, when they analyze the patients, uh, the group of patients that uh, were not initiated uh, on the oxygen the support, there is a signal the trend uh, towards a worse outcome to those uh, without the oxygen the supplementation. Um, and uh, there are a few the predefined the subgroup that they go about, uh, they went about to do a subgroup analysis. So regardless of uh, the age of the age group of the patient, gender of the patient, um, as well as the uh, baseline, the risk, is uh, uniformly across the group that the uh, dexamethasone uh, showed the superiority over the standard uh, uh, care. And uh, if you look at the, some of the secondary outcomes, such as discharge from a hospital, as well as the uh, development of uh, uh, requiring the use of invasive mechanical uh, ventilation, it, um, majority of the uh, secondary outcomes do show the trend towards uh, favoring the, the use of uh, dexamethasone. So I think uh, the recovery, the trial was done in a period where there are multiple to other studies concurrently to, uh, being conducted uh, throughout the world. And uh, WHO uh, um, have actually uh, see this as an opportunity to actually uh, conduct a prospective uh, meta-analysis for selected uh, group of uh, um, studies that, uh, are, um, that are evaluating the similar uh, kind of uh, outcome uh, with uh, critical uh, steroids. And with the publication of the recovery the trial, some of these studies are stopped uh, because uh, they felt that uh, the standard of care would have been uh, modified uh, because of the release of the recovery trial. And uh, in JAMA in September the, this year, uh, three of these trials uh, was actually the published uh, concurrently together the, with the WHO the method analysis. Right, so the REMAT CAP is actually a pre-existing clinical trial the design the looking at the community acquired the pneumonia. And it's also a uh, adaptive uh, platform and they actually modified it uh, for uh, studies uh, uh, in uh, both a pandemic as well as a non-pandemic uh, uh, era. And uh, what they have done is that uh, they look at um, um, more than the 384, about 384 the patients uh, within the, uh, in, in eight different uh, countries involving more than 121 uh, sites. And these are patients, uh, adult uh, patients with uh, suspected or uh, confirmed uh, COVID-19. Uh, with uh, severe the disease, and by severe disease means that, that they are admitted uh, to the ICU with some form of uh, organ support, be it respiratory or cardiovascular the support. And uh, there are three group of patients that they and uh, that uh, they recruit these patients uh, in. So one group, the 143 patients, were in the fixed dose hydrocortisone steroid uh, group, where they receive intravenous uh, hydrocortisone at 50 milligrams every Q6 hourly, 
uh, near the end of the studies, they actually uh, have another group that uh, they use a higher dose of uh, hydrocortisone, uh, uh, hydro the cortisone. But because the trial was stopped early, there are very, very few patients on the higher the dose of hydrocortisone. There's another group, 152 patients, that was on shock dependent uh, use. And uh, this used the standard uh, hydrocortisone the dosage that we typically use in the ICU at 50 milligrams uh, every Q6 hourly. And uh, the third group would be the group that where a uh, standard of care was given, so with no hydrocortisone uh, usage at all. And the primary outcome that they were looking at are basically the organ support uh, free days. So these are days alive and free of intensive care, your unit based respiratory or cardiovascular to support uh, within the 20 21 days of uh, randomization. And um, they did a uh, bohesens analysis. And what they conclude at the end of the studies uh, when they analyze it is that uh, in the fixed dose group, there's a 93% probability that uh, the, the uh, odds uh, ratio the, for the improvement of uh, superiority is about 1.43, while in the shock dependent group, um, 80%, there's an 80% probability that uh, there is a uh, there is a probability for superiority of the corticosteroids uh, uh, therapy. But because uh, these uh, studies were stopped early uh, and none of the uh, treatment the strategy actually met the pre-specified uh, criteria for statistical uh, superiority. So this actually the, this makes it very, very difficult uh, for the uh, author uh, to uh, in, to actually make a conclusive of comments about uh, the corticosteroid uh, use. So the, in the uh, interest of time, I will just uh, go to the meta-analysis, which was actually conducted uh, through the efforts of, uh, coordinated through the efforts of WHO. And what they did is that uh, they actually conduct, uh, contacted the uh, primary investigators for some of the ongoing the clinical trials on corticosteroids. And, um, and these uh, trials, uh, actually, the, they were very gracious uh, in uh, providing WHO uh, with all their patient uh, data, even before the publications uh, of their own uh, studies. And I think suffice uh, to say that um, when uh, they do a meta-analysis of all these uh, studies, they, what uh, the conclusion was that uh, the use of uh, critical uh, steroids in patients in, with a uh, critical to uh, ill um, uh, status, there is a the improvement in the odds ratio of mortality of up to 0.66 with clinical uh, confidence interval of 0.53 to 0.82. And uh, this is, uh, and no matter how you slice and dice it, uh, this is uh, consistent uh, if you look at uh, whether the, the studies was uh, using the dexamethasone or hydrocortisone. And uh, the consistent, and the treatment effect is also the consistent regards to either using a high dose or low dose of cortical uh, steroids. And there's very, very little the signal regards to potential uh, for harm. And, um, and so the, what um, has that the translator to in real world? So I think that at this uh, time point, the dexamethasone is probably the, the um, study, the only the therapy the, with a uh, uh, relatively high the level of uh, um, uh, clinical the study to actually the support the, the use in terms of uh, mod modulating the mortality risk uh, for patients uh, with a more severe form of COVID-19. And uh, all these uh, publications was made in, uh, in, the, uh, in the last uh, three months. And I think uh, in the context of the Singapore, um, when we were dealing with the influx of um, critically ill patients in ICU, all these uh, studies was not really the known at that time. So I think uh, anecdotally, uh, we have uh, very few the patients that uh, we have a lot of experience on uh, using the dexamethasone. But I think uh, moving uh, forward, uh, this would be definitely the, the a therapy that I would consider to, for patients uh, who require the oxygen the supplementation uh, and uh, are admitted to, to the ICU. And of course, uh, whether the, the, the use of dexamethasone alone the, versus uh, the combination the therapy with antiviral the, would have additive uh, benefit is uh, something that I think we will need more rigorous clinical trials to actually to help us uh, in our decisions and making. Uh, with that, I will be happy to take any other questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Siwa. Uh, right now, there are no questions in the Q&A yet, so I'll, I'd like to encourage our participants uh, to please post your questions if you have any. Uh, Dr. Siwa, I just have a question for you. Uh, of course, as you've uh, mentioned with regards to uh, the search of uh, information that we're having and information sharing, uh, we can see that our research has really progressed and uh, now these are rapid meta-analysis are being put together. Uh, 
but going down to on the ground then, uh, would your recommendation still be uh, for dexamethasone as the choice of a steroid? And uh, would you be uh, recommending the use of a dose, uh, for example, in the recovery trial where they use uh, six milligrams uh, daily, or for some of the other trials where they use uh, different doses as high as uh, 20 milligrams once a day? Well, in the context of our the local the ICU, I think uh, we there is availability of both uh, dexamethasone as well as uh, hydrocortisone. Um, based on the meta-analysis by the WHO, seems like the, the effect in terms of uh, modulating the host inflammatory response and then the, the in terms of the mortality, the benefit seems to be a plus uh, effect rather than a specific uh, uh, drug uh, choice. So I think I'm comfortable to, uh, with using the either of uh, depending on the, the availability the you know, institution. I know that uh, in other the, uh, uh, in, uh, other hospitals or in the, in the regional the, or sites internationally, uh, not all the uh, cortical steroids will be available to, uh, for use. So I say that uh, just use what the cortical steroids that you have uh, in the unit. Uh, use the cortical steroids uh, that you have experience in so that uh, in terms of managing some of the complications, you will be very, very familiar with how to actually the, uh, manage some of the complications that you may foresee arising. Regards to the dosing of the hydrocortisone, I think um, uh, there is uh, no the, uh, signal that uh, using a higher dose of dexamethasone uh, or hydrocorticals or steroids have additional the benefit. So I will be uh, recommending the use of relatively the lower dose of steroids so as to avoid uh, some of the potential complications that may arise with higher the dosing of uh, steroids. Over. Thank you, Dr. Siwa. Uh, next up uh, for our segment, we have uh, Dr. Pua Sehon. Dr. Pua is a consultant respiratory physician and intensivist uh, working in the respiratory and critical care medicine department in Tan Tok Seng Hospital. Now, uh, Dr. Pua is also currently the program director for the National Health Group Respiratory Medicine Residency Program, as well as being clinical director for the respiratory therapy services in Tan Tok Seng Hospital. His fields of interest include obstructive airway diseases, bronchiectasis, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, the question uh, that I was going to pose to uh, Dr. Pua uh, is with regards to our use of our invasive mechanical ventilation, high flow nasal cannula, non invasive ventilation, and a weight pool positioning uh, in the ICU. Uh, Dr. Pua, could you share with us uh, your personal approach about these measures and how it was like trying to make sense of it all while in the eye of the storm early on in the pandemic and how your thoughts and uses of these therapies might have changed uh, during this time? Uh, Dr. Pua, sure. please. Thanks, Pip, for the introduction and thanks again for the organizers for this opportunity to share this information. Uh, just want to say out loud that uh, at the, I'm going to share some data which is all uh, collected over the time of the pandemic and uh, this data could not have uh, come to fruition without all the efforts that help from all the intensivists all around the country. And I'd just like to uh, say a big thanks to all the support that we have received throughout the, the, the period of the pandemic. Now, um, actually from the original question from the, uh, Professor Gattinoni's talk uh, at the beginning and about the uh, awake proning. So I think we, we noticed quite early on when we started proning patients in the ICU, that there was a very marked, remarkable, marked improvement in the oxygen saturation. And I think that got us to think, and when the numbers started to come up uh, and more and more patients were, were receiving oxygen in the general wards, we started to uh, get worried that our ICUs would get inundated. And I think what we have noticed is that uh, when we prone patients, uh, they are, not only did their saturations improve, but their PF ratios actually improve as well. And one of the preventive methods that, met, uh, one of the preventive techniques that we were hoping to uh, apply in the general ward before even coming to the hospital was awake proning. I think we started our first awake proning roughly sometime in April. And that's when all the data started coming out in being published on prone positioning in COVID-19 ARDS and also awake prone in the general wards. And uh, so uh, the NCID actually came out with a very nice protocol uh, done up by uh, Dr. Ng Tujin, one of our senior residents, together with uh, Dr. Tae Wu Chow, uh, one of our IM residents, and also Dr. Benjamin Ho, where patients actually prone for themselves at least one hour, five times a day. And initially, there was a little bit of skepticism. Uh, you know, some people feel it's very uncomfortable to just lie on your tummy for one hour, but with a fully charged phone, an iPad, enough data, 
uh, with a net with a Netflix subscription subscription account, that one hour go for fly by very fast. And then anecdotally, I think some people have even reported that um, despite not being an oxygen, some of these patients actually do feel better lying down on prone and they continue to do so even after discharge at home. So I just want to share a couple of the of 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 uh, these slides here. So this is uh, also then subsequently published in the ERJ on this case series of 10 patients, again, by the same people who actually wrote up the protocol. And they had a median prone hours of 21. And most patients were started to do this awake proning on day nine of their illness. And they had quite good outcomes. Out of the 10 patients, the highest oxygen requirement, one needed was high flow. Two was venti mass at, uh, venturi mass at 50%. However, out of the 10, one actually got intubated and then eventually passed on. So that one patient probably was a little bit more severe. So for patients in the ICU, uh, this is a uh, nice work by, uh, by Rui, Dr. Lee Rui Min from Tanah Singh as well, which got published in the in Annals of Academy of Medicine. And we looked at uh, AR, severe ARDS patients and when, what happens when we prone them. And we noticed that actually within the first two hours and 12 hours, there's a, there's a, there's a market improvement in, in PF ratios and a reduction in CO2. But interestingly, when we unprone them, back in, putting them back in the supine, these changes were not really sustained. So despite that, I think we should still consider, consider proning them early, especially in the general ward when they start needing oxygenation. Because prone... Uh, it's actually a free technique that you can use and it doesn't cost you anything. And, uh, you know, it, it shows improvement in oxygenation and hopefully that will actually reduce the amount of patients self-inflicted lung injury, uh, you know, probably perpetuated from the hypoxemic states that they were in. Now, I think what happened was at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all really afraid to start using non-invasive ventilators and especially high-flow nasal cannulas. But I think as the pandemic went on, more and more data came out, we became a little bit more braver and we decided to give, give high flow nasal cannula a try. And we had quite good outcomes and data uh, coming out from it anecdotally. And a few hospitals around uh, Singapore contributed data on patients on high flow nasal cannula. I'm going to show you some unpublished data and just share the local context of what has happened so far. And as you can see, we actually looked at 50 patients uh, that have, have ever received high flow nasal cannula for hypoxemic respiratory failure and it was a split between the middle where half of them actually got intubated and the other half did not get intubated. So if you look at the univariate analysis over here, it's not really surprising that those that failed high flow nasal cannula tended to be older and their PF ratios also tend to be lower. Now the total high flow hours was definitely longer in the non-intubated patients because they received it more before and because they, and they didn't because they didn't require intubation um, the crps didn't really differ much and those that got intubated had higher mortality rates of course they stayed longer in the hospital and stayed longer in the icu now what, what i think was interesting is that when we actually studied the rocks index and this looking at two hour six hour and 12 hour mark which was actually pub, uh, which was published previously that showed actually there's a very nice um, a cutoff where it may predict high flow nasal cannula failure. Actually, in our cohort in Singapore, we actually didn't really see any uh, the, the cutoff actually matched with the previous ones for hypoxemic respiratory failure from community acquired pneumonia. So this may allude that that the ROCS index may not be very useful for patients coming with COVID. We are always worried that when we put on high flows, we put on non-invasive ventilators, that you know, we are worried for aerosolization of the viral particles itself. And this is a very nice paper by Geckel et al. But they looked at 10 well patients and they looked at droplet dispersion. And uh, they actually measured the droplet dispersion when patients are on these modalities, while they are breathing normally, when they are talking, when they take deep breathing, or when they cough. And interestingly, they found that the high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilator, actually the droplet dispersion was not very marked at all. In fact, it's quite similar to somebody who was on room air. And, but for those using non rebreather masks at high flows at 50 liters per minute at face masks, uh, they actually found that the droplet dispersion was a little bit more as compared to the other modalities. So this may allude that it's actually may, may not be as 
worrisome as we all uh, were thinking it to be. And uh, at this juncture, so far, thankfully, none of our, our, our staff have actually contracted COVID despite using all these modalities. And uh, uh, Dr. Sean Ong, uh, one of the infectious disease SR from um, NCID, working together with Dr. Ling and Dr. Kalis and their team, actually have published a very nice article on where they actually sampled the environment in the ICU and outside the ICU to look for whether there's any viable viruses. And despite being on high flow nasal cannula and invasive mechanical ventilation, or there's actually no risk of trans uh, the, the viral load that they actually found was actually very low. In fact, the, the CT values were very high, which may indicate that the viruses were not, were not even viable at that point of time. Now, from high flow, I just want to share with you some of the data of our invasive patients that re required invasive mechanical ventilation. So we've always questioned that since Professor Gattinoni and Professor Marini's talk on the different phenotypes of CARDS or COVID-related ARDS, where there's the L and the H phenotype, which is now quite popularized, we always wondering, we always wonder whether this COVID-related ARDS is it typical ARDS or is it something different or is it different type of phenotypes all around the world? So um, I looked at a couple of papers. One is this uh, paper by McNicholas et al. And this is actually from the lung safe population. And this paper was published end of last year, looking at the difference between males and females with regards to ARDS. But once you put them all together, these are the values that I managed to get. Ferrando et al. is a Sp Spanish paper where it's one of the largest series of COVID ARDS characteristics, uh, which has been published recently and also summarized over here. And this is our data here looking at 102 ever intubated patients since the beginning of the uh, pandemic. As you can see, we, 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 we have kind of matched quite nicely in terms of age, gender, Apache scores. Our SOFA scores were a little bit lower as compared to uh, Ferrando's paper and definitely the, the paper by McNichols at all. And one of the reasons why we were discussing the, the reasons why our SOFA scores were low is because I think we bring them down to the ICU a lot earlier. As you can see, majority of our ARDS were moderate. The days, from symptom onset to mechanical ventilation in our court was a bit shorter, seven days. But looking at the plateau pressures and the driving pressures and the compliance, the values, they're all pretty much similar and on the low side instead of the high side. We didn't do any recruitment maneuvers, uh, or obviously actually didn't document any recruitment maneuvers uh, within the country. However, our usage of prone positioning was only 52%, but this is gathered over time. So since the pandemic started, our first ICU patient that landed uh, uh, to us in February up to June, um, I think we started to prone more towards uh, the, the, after the one third of the pandemic and then up to today. So, uh, the, but the use, usage of neuromuscular blockers were pretty high at 68.6%. And as, as we all know, about 5% of our patients actually underwent ECMO. Uh, and the thing to point out, I think we are still very, very fortunate that our mortality rates for ever intubated patients were actually on the low side at 14.7%. And this is lower than, uh, than Ferrando et al. and the ARDS population here. And if you compare it with the New York cohort where the, the, the mortality rates of invasive mechanical ventilation patients were, were as high as 70 to 80%, and this, is, this is really something um, we need to look into and why our rates are on the lower side. And uh, was just thank our lucky stars at this. So with looking at ARDS uh, on a whole, with regards to our local population compared to other populations, now I want to address the compliance portion of COVID-related ARDS as well. And we found, uh, and when we looked at the Professor Gattinoli's paper where he says that predominant patients that he actually noticed were all towards the L phenotype with low elastins, i.e. high compliance. I think about 60 to 70% of his patients had compliance rates above 40 towards the 50s ratio. And if, when we actually look at our own data, uh, we actually had 67 patients in that 102 cohort with compliance data values. And we, we, we drew a 40 uh, mils per centimeter wa water cutoff for, to, to signify high compliance versus low compliance. And in our cohort, when we look, we see L meaning high compliance, actually majority of ours were on the low side. 
most of our patients actually had poor compliance at 64 point, 64%. And looking at the plateau pressures and drying pressures, it actually fits towards, it's definitely higher compared to patients with better compliance. Interestingly, our patients with better lung compliance had a higher mortality rate, and this was statistically significant. We're not too sure why patients starting off with good compliance had higher mortality rate, but what we are certain, we, are, we know for certain is that if you were to start off with a high compliance, and over time your compliance drop to become low compliance, or drop from, from, you start off with the L group and drop to the H phenotype, your, your mortality rate definitely is on the higher side. So I think these are a few of the interesting local data that I was hoping to share with the panel and to all of you. And I'm, I, I, if there's any questions and discussions that can stem out of this, it would be fantastic. But, uh, just to summarize, I think what uh, we have noticed, our practice has changed. How has it changed? At the beginning, we we're definitely not proning patients as much as we, we, we did uh, at this current juncture. We are definitely doing awake proning now, which was never heard of in the past. Uh, the usage of steroids were initially frowned on as what uh, Seva has alluded to, but now suddenly it's like one of the main drugs to be given up front at the very, very beginning when your oxygen levels drop. We are using high flow a lot more frequent now, but whether we need better data on our cutoff on to see who we can stratify at high risk of requiring invasive mechanical ventilation and, and intervene much earlier rather than wait and then delay the intubation process. Uh, I must say that I've, I've not heard that we have used NIV or, uh, on anybody with a, with pos who are positive uh, COVID in our country thus far. Uh, but if you have any experience, it would be good to share. But experiences around the world show that it's still quite safe in terms of usage. And I think... Um, the idea is probably personalized mechanical ventilation to the, and catered to the patient per se, looking at their compliance, looking at their lung mechanics, and perhaps adjusting your PEEP and tidal volumes according to that, maintaining all the ARDS uh, uh, benefits, which is to lower the blood to pressure and lower the driving pressure as best as you can. With that, uh, I'd like to end this, uh, my, my sharing and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pa, uh, for that. And I think, uh, Dr. Pa, you had uh, also uh, initially alluded to earlier that uh, we had the luxury, I think, of uh, being able to bring our patients down to ICU quite early. And uh, I think there's no way of telling if that uh, really was a contributing factor as well, given that uh, we did manage to preserve uh, most of our ICU resources uh, for many of our patients over here. Uh, I think now we'll quickly uh, move on to Dr. Tan's uh, segment. Uh, and Dr. Tan Chiket is our senior consultant and anesthesiologist and intensivist at Ng Ting Fong General Hospital, uh, where she is the current head of uh, department. Uh, she is also dually accredited in both anesthesiology and intensive care medicine and underwent training uh, in critical care medicine in Alfred Hospital in Australia, uh, as well as in King's College London. Uh, in addition, Dr. Tan was previously director of the Surgical Intensive Care Unit at the National University Hospital and was previously associate professor at Yong Lulin School of Medicine at National University of Singapore. Uh, Dr. Tan, uh, thank you for joining us today. Our last topic is perhaps the most challenging, the effects of how all these therapies have affected us in the ICU. Uh, and in your role as head of uh, ICU for ho your hospital, could you share with us the framework you've had to employ with regards to implementation of these therapies, some of the challenges you have faced and the psychological effect it has had on yourself and your department during this uh, pandemic. Uh, Dr. Tan, please. Hi. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kua. Um, I would like to take you through some of the, some of the scenario in ICU through some pictures that I will be sharing here. From January onwards, uh, when, we, when we receive our first patient, uh, when we have first uh, COVID patients, in Singapore, we are, this ICU is in crisis mode since January, and we have been treating all patients with respiratory symptoms, fever, as COVID suspect. And this is the picture that shows the scenario in a pandemic ICU. The, 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 the fear factor is very high in the beginning, and most of the staff are gowned with the, this 
space suits uh, PAPR, whether they are suspect or they are they are uh, COVID uh, patients. They are with all these space suits, uh, PAPR. Some of the patients, some of the staff, are managed to alleviate the fears on this highly transmittable disease and care for the patients in the, the patient's room. And some of the staff prefer to stay in the room, whether they are, they are on treatments with high aerosolized uh, procedures with the PAPR, as long as the whole treatment period, uh, four, four or five hours when they are monitoring the patients, when they are doing procedures, uh, they are inside the rooms with this highly protective uh, PAPR suit. Uh, they have tried to modify the communication with the unit's uh, staff with whiteboard, with sign sig signal, uh, and try to finish whatever treatments within the rooms uh, during this period of time. And we, uh, the, 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 the team, some of them are so afraid to, uh, so, some of them are very afraid to go home and the hospital have prepared food accommodations and scrub for them to, during this, these periods to make sure they, they are taken care, the, the, the well-being of this patient are taken care of. The hospital allowed staff that if young kids are less than two years old and elderly more than 80 years old to stay around the hospital. We are also told to prepare as much as 70 isolation rooms for the COVID patient. And we started the preparations from January onwards, clear up all the rooms, prepare the, the equipments and beds for this uh, unopened ICU within the unit. And we take out all the equipments from the pandemic store. We have a lot of uh, ventilator. We have a lot of uh, pumps and also dialysis machines during this time. We take out all these machines to test out, to have the latest maintenance, and also take out all the store of uh, protective equipments to train our staff. In terms of trainings, we also have deployed staff from anesthesia and also from surgical departments to help out during this period. We call back up all the staff. We cancel all the annual leave. We start basic ICU trainings and also de uh, of the deployed staff uh, so that they can function when the real tsunami comes. During this crisis, we do have team separations and social distancing. And the tough part is there's no visiting policies during this period in the pandemic ICU. And did this make the management of the, 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 the families are difficult? They like to see the loved one when they are sick. We allow phone uh, communications with the family by the patients and also staff will update them daily at 11 o'clock. So. And one of the things that uh, the, 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 during these COVID times, the testimonial of the staff is uh, with the preparations that we have to, and the care that we have provided to them, they have been able to cope with the, the infectious disease with, um, with quite well because we only have 28 patients that admitted to the unit. And we do not have the tsunami that we anticipate uh, uh, during this time. And we also very, very grateful that there is no patients to staff transmission reported so far in the unit. Uh, since then, uh, the, since the, the, in April, we do not have any more patients that have uh, come that have, uh, that have diagnosed uh, COVID during this time. And, but then in the units, we still have very high focus on uh, how to prevent infectious disease for patients that come in from ED, from ward. And we are uh, still doing a lot of um, 
Gowning's uh, preparation for, uh, for treating these patients, uh, COVID suspect with high alert, uh, high alert uh, precautions. So anybody that come from ED with fever, shortness of breath and, and with chest x-ray changes, they are treating a COVID su suspect. And uh, most of the staff are still using all these uh, PAPR then when we look after the patients. Uh, the challenges we have when the patients have suspect COVID come to the units are when do we send to for imaging, when do we send for operations and, and there will be a lot of delays because we are still waiting for a PCR negative before we administer some of the, the interventions. Uh, we are doing quite a lot of innovations uh, projects during this time and looking for ways to modify our treatments uh, to cope with uh, infectious disease. The, one of the pictures here showing uh, the uh, patients with code blue, we, we, we have to prevent, uh, we have to attend the patient quickly and prevent uh, aerosolizations during the chest compressions. One of the papers, one of the, the, the things that we do is to put the patient on the intubation box and also put the patients or put a, 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 a papers to cover the patients when we do chest compressions. And the other innovations that we have uh, during this time is to have this uh, called a box that put patients on treatments when they are on NIV and also on a high flow nasal cannula. Uh, they are ways, many, many ways that we do try on to prevent infections and prevent spreads to the patients during this, this time. Uh, these are the things that we do uh, in ICU uh, during COVID. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tan, for your sharing. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, I'll try and group them together. Uh, the first one, uh, is regarding feeding during prone positioning, uh, Dr. Paul. Uh, if I may direct that question at you, uh, regarding how we manage feeding during prone position, I suppose for both our uh, awake prone positioning uh, and as well for uh, intubated and ventilated patients. So I think for the intubated and ventilated patients are uh, pretty straightforward. So uh, with the NG tube, you just flip them over and then feeding is not an issue. <clears throat> Sorry. In fact, that we actually managed to dialyze patients while uh, on the prone position as well. So, but during the awake uh, prone positioning, I think because they are only uh, prone for about an hour each time, more if they are able to, uh, it's not an issue for them to just unprone and then just take their food and then prone back again, especially if that's not an issue for them. Uh, thank you. And... Uh, I guess the next question is really uh, revolving around our mortality. Uh, the question posed uh, is regarding why uh, the mortality in ventilated patients in Singapore ICUs is lower compared to the US and European ICUs, and whether it's because, uh, as you've alluded to earlier, that we brought them in earlier to ICU, uh, early, or we initiated them on mechanical ventilation earlier, didn't try NIV, or just that we had different standards of care. And related to that question, uh, is uh, regarding the survival rate of uh, patients with PF ratio less than 100. Uh, maybe I could ask Dr. Siwa to give us his take on, the, uh, on this question first and then move back to Dr. Pa and Dr. Tan. Uh, Dr. Siwa, please. Um, I think uh, the low mortality rate that we are seeing in our ICUs is probably due to combinations of uh, factors. I mean, I think one of the key things is that uh, the, our national ICU was never really the overwhelmed, even at the peak of the pandemic. Um, there was very, very good uh, uh, public policies that was put in place uh, to limit the, uh, the spread of uh, the COVID-19. And the majority of the uh, pandemic that we are seeing was uh, among the dormitories uh, workers who are relatively of a younger the age and for less uh, comorbidities. So I think that helped uh, to actually to reduce uh, some of this um, high mortality that we are seeing in some of the other uh, countries. Of course, um, um, these, I would venture to say that uh, our standard of care the, in the ICU are fairly high the, uniformly across the, the different uh, hospitals. So I think uh, that uh, do 
allow us to manage our patients uh, well. But of course, uh, this uh, is something that um, will obviously uh, change uh, if the whole ICUs are, are overwhelmed with a lot of patients, the standard of care may potentially uh, drop. So I think it's very, very important that, that some of the uh, national the measures that we made in terms of the social distancing, good uh, uh, quarantine uh, measures, good uh, contact uh, tracing are done in place so that uh, we will never be in a situation uh, where our, pa our patients are dying in the ICU. Over. Thank you, Dr. Siwa. Uh, Dr. Tan, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts to share about this? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is uh, that uh, it, it's, uh, the facility is not overwhelmed. And there are a lot of collaborations between the ICU units and we shall share our information. There's also guidance of infectious disease uh, expert in, in, uh, in, in the treatments, in the specific treatments of the patients. Uh, our general, generally, the ICU, we have very little patients during this period of time when we have more than enough time. We call back most of the staff uh, during this time to, uh, to, 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 to care for the patients. So the patients and staff ratio, staff to patient ratio is very, very good during this period of time. And we could give them attention uh, 24 hours. Thanks, Dr. Tan. And uh, Dr. Pua, do you have uh, anything else to add about this? And then also maybe to share with us, uh, what do you think our mortality of uh, patients with PF ratio less than 100 has been? Okay. So, so I think I agree with all the other speakers just now. I think the, whole, the fact that a whole country just got together, bended together and worked together, that, that, that probably really helped our numbers and really helped in uh, our mortality rates as well. And again, we all alluded to the availability of resources, which definitely is an important point because I know of places where they ventilate patients in the wards. And I think the original papers from Wuhan as well kind of hinted in their, in, in, in their write-ups that they actually had to intubate and ventilate patients in the general ward and asking staff who are not trained in ICU care or ever managed ICU patients to help to, to level up and, and start managing these patients as well. Now, with regards to the low PF ratio mortality, we didn't really analyze them because our uh, severe PF, uh, severe ARDS at PF less than 100 was only about 8.8%. So I think those numbers were pretty small for us to do a proper analysis on. But having said that, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised. And I think it has already been shown by other papers uh, uh, that has been published that if you start off with a very bad PF ratio, I think probably outcomes will be worse off. So wouldn't be surprised with that. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, to all our expert panelists, thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts on the issues uh, regarding COVID-19 therapies today. I think one of the key points that this pandemic has really uh, uh, taught us is about the spirit of collaboration and how collaboration uh, between different disciplines, different teams, different hospitals, uh, different countries uh, has really helped uh, to lead the way uh, during these difficult times. And uh, in Singapore, I, I would uh, venture to say we have been quite privileged uh, in our availability of resources uh, in helping us to uh, deal with this uh, pandemic. So uh, if there are no further questions uh, from the audience, I'd like to thank uh, all our expert panelists once again uh, for all uh, your kind uh, input today. And uh, to thanks to all our participants also for taking part in uh, this international conference. And we do hope to see all of you again at uh, our subsequent sessions and also at our future events. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks very much.